Scott Carlson, Stan Spirit Research. I'm here at the 2018 Alliance Conference in Las Vegas. I'm here with uh, Dennis Garman. He is the editor and publisher of the Garman Letter, an all-around good guy, Mr. Yeah, Garman. Well, you, you did exactly what I asked you for. Fantastic. Thank Certainly. You. Thanks you, for being you, here. You guys will obviously allow anybody to be interviewed, so. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, uh, that was an awesome presentation. Thank you. Certainly. Um, so the first question, during your presentation, you mentioned trade deficits are good. Yeah. How do you think this compares with the current thinking in the market and economics in general? First of all, our administration, and I, and I voted for Mr. Trump in the last election, and I, as I told the audience, I'm somewhat to the right of Genghis Khan politically and economically, but I think our, our focus upon trade deficits and our attempt to inhibit trade, our, our attempts to put in trade tariffs and trade protection, is absolutely bald-facedly wrong. As I told the audience, we, we concern ourselves with China too much, and I think we have a great deal with China. We get stuff from China, and we give them paper in return. That, to me, sounds like a great idea. That's a, that, that's a great trade. Why should we stop doing that? And yet we've been told that running trade deficits is, is a bad thing. We have been uh, running trade deficits for 60 years, and yet the country's in better shape. Yeah, I, I thought you, you used an excellent analysis talking about how you, know, you run a trade deficit with your mechanic, yes, with the grocery store. E exactly. Really good point. Yeah, people forget that. Should I try to run a trade surplus with my mechanic? I can't possibly do that. I run a trade surplus with somebody else, or I run a capital inflow. That's, that's how it, it, it works that way in micro terms. It works that way in macro and international terms. Well, I'm thinking most businesses would have a problem running a trade deficit with everybody. That yes, exactly. Say, yes. That's exactly correct. Would not be a profitable way to do business. It would be a terribly unprofitable way to do business. Yes, sir. And what's your favorite asset class currently? Commodities. Commodities generally, uh, and I think th this is an important day. Here we've had in the past 48 hours, as, as in, in the past year or two, as has gone the euro, so has gone, gone gold. If euro rallied, gold rallied. If euro fell, gold fell. And in the last 48 hours, the euro has fallen and gold has risen dramatically. That's a change, so I'm really quite supportive of the gold market of a sudden, uh, and I'm also very supportive of the grain markets. I think even though we are abundant with grain and even though we, we will produce more grain this year than last year and more grain next year than this year, the world's population is probably, the demand is going to be, is going to continue to be greater. So I, I like commodities generally. Give me, coal, give, me gra give me gold first, give me the grain second. People definitely need to eat. People do need to eat. I've heard that. Yeah. Um, and, and with gold, your, your comments in there were intriguing to me. How much do you think this is because of the political situation going on in Italy and in Germany right now? Oh, I think it's a, 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 terribly incumbent upon what's happening in Italy. Uh, if you're an Italian, if you're an, a, a European, and you hold a, a fair amount of euros, and you watch what's going on in, in Italy, and the, it, politically it's, it's being torn asunder, and the, it, the Italian government has thumbed its nose at, at Brussels and said, look, we don't really care if you're going to impose upon us a, a uh, budget to, to GDP deficit of 3%. We're going to go through that. We have no choice because of what happened in Genoa. Uh, when that bridge collapsed, it's abundantly clear that Italy needs uh, massive spending upon infrastructure. They're going to run massive budget deficits. Berlin will not like that. Paris will not like that. Brussels will not like that. But the Italian people will. I think that's terribly indicative of, of political circumstances that are going to go, that are going and, and will go awry at a rather rapid pace. I, I, I think one thing that, that people don't pay enough attention to that, that really could have a big impact going forward is the fact that Italy has the second highest debt to GDP ratio in Europe. In Europe. And they're second only to Greece. Yeah. And GDP, I'm, I'm sorry, Italy has the third biggest economy in Europe too, and Greece has a 20th. Yeah. The, it really dwarfs, and it's, it's a big deal. Pe people are not paying attention to that fact. They tend to yes. look at Italy and Greece as being equal. No, Italy is six times larger than, than is Greece, and needs to be, people need to understand that. And the political circumstances in Italy are really tenuous at best and uncomfortable at worst. And then we have, uh, just over the weekend, we have a resurgence of Catalonian separatism uh, being born again once, once more in Spain. Pay attention to these things. Yes, and you've got to pay attention to Austria, too, because they're watching everything that's going on. And the Brexit process, too, is, is very much in focus with all these guys. Yeah, it, as, as I've often said, we, think, we tend to think that Californians are demonstrably different than Virginians, but we are demonstrably closer in, in, in po politics and philosophy and religion than are the various countries in Europe. The, the dichotomies that exist within Europe compared to the United States are, are really astonishing. Very fair. Um, what is your opinion of emerging markets here? My, my friend Don Cox has one of the great lines when it comes to emerging markets in history. Don said that emerging markets are markets from which you cannot emerge in an emergency. I love that line. I will let other people invest in emerging markets, and I wish them nothing but well. Uh, but you walk in one day, and suddenly there's a tsunami in Indonesia causes great problems. 
There's a, a revolution in, in, in Kenya. It causes great problems. There's political dissension in Uganda. I'll let other people who are far wiser than I make their bets on, on emerging markets. I have enough trouble making my bets on the United States, Canada, Europe, Japan, and even China. If you wish to bet on emerging markets, I wish you nothing but great will, great ill, or great, great wealth and, and, and great welfare. I shan't. Great point. Besides your job, what keeps you up at night? I worry, if I have to worry about one thing at night, and the one thing that when I come down to my office at 1 o'clock in the morning every morning to write the Gartman letter, the first thing I check is, did India and Pakistan go to war last night? I'm always worried about that because those are two belligerent countries fighting over the same territories that they have fought with since 1948, and they have nuclear weapons. And they're not nice people when it comes to fighting one another. Once I get past 105 and I realize that India and Pakistan have not gone to war, then I look to see what's going on in the Middle East. Those are the things that keep me up at night. Did you learn more from your biggest success or your biggest failure? From my biggest failure. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. And, and everybody learns from their failure. And if they don't, they're going to be out of the business. I once took on, as a, I was a floor trader in Chicago, uh, trading bonds and Jenny Mays and trading bonds and notes. And I once took on PIMCO, uh, bald-facedly. And it, and it took me about a minute and a half to lose several hundred thousand dollars by, adding into a, by averaging into a trade that was going against me. That stuck with me for the rest of my life. You cannot help but learn from that. Buying more of something that's going against you is the one thing that will take everybody out of the business at some time. And, and so I have this, uh, this mantra. I want to do more of the things that have been working, and I want to try to do less of the things that have not. Adding to losing trades is a loser's game. That's the, that's the lesson I learned from, from adversity. That's a great point. Thank you. Um, a couple more here for you. Do you expect a rapid market rally at the end of this bull market run? No. I think we're getting extremely high. I, I don't mind owning U.S. Share, U.S. shares while being short of European and Asian shares, but I, I think American shares in and of themselves are extremely expensive. Maybe there's a short covering rally that gets that gets goofy on the upside, but I think that I, I think probably that won't happen. You, it sounded like you you see again you see more value in commodities right now. I see much more value in commodities. Uh, I, I, if, if you only could allow me to do one trade, I'll buy commodities and I'll sell Europe and I'll sell Jap Japanese stocks. That's that's. That's a beta of about six, okay, but that's probably a, a, a great idea. Now, while we're on the subject of commodities, you think there's any shot the U.S. goes back to the gold standard? No, not at all. Well, I, in my lifetime, no. In my daughter's lifetime, no. In my daughter's, in, in, in my hoped-for grandchildren's lifetime, no. Do I put it out of, uh, out of the reach in the next 200 years? No, that's possible, but in my lifetime, it's not going to happen. Fair enough. Um, and why do you think most investors have been on the sidelines during this rally? Because they've misunderstood um, how, just how strong the U.S. economy really has been. It's been impressive. The Fed did exactly the right thing in, in 2007, 8, and 9 by injecting reserve into the system. That money has made its way into the equities markets. People have doubted that uh, that's ability to do so. Uh, but now, as I said, I think American stocks are getting a little, they're a little sporty. Uh, would I buy stocks? Would I buy U.S. stocks in and of themselves without having them hedged at this point? No, I would not do that. And then the last one, uh, your single most important piece of advice for investors. Do more of that which has been working and less of that which is not. I cannot reiterate that strongly enough. I mean, it, it is what separates pros from amateurs. Pros, on balance, will lose 60 to 65 percent of their trades, but on the 30 or 35 percent of the trades that they have on, they'll make multiples of their money. Amateurs, quite honestly, probably make money 90% of the time and lose money on balance because the 10% of the trades that go against them, they average into and lose enormous sums of money. If I can leave the audience with anything, that's the most important thing. Fair enough. Thank Truly you for, a pleasure. It's my honor. Thank you for Thank asking you. me. Appreciate it. If you're enjoying these videos, don't forget to press that like button. Comment down below. And if you're new here, don't forget to subscribe, please. And remember to click that bell to be sure you don't miss out on our newest updates. Stay tuned for more updates from our Vegas conference.